All right, so this evening's sermon, I want, we're going to be doing kind of a Bible study into King Saul. And the title of my sermon is An Evil Spirit from the Lord. And we're going to see how, how God sent an evil spirit upon King Saul. We're going to look kind of what, what brought that on and some of the attributes of, of King Saul. And one of the reasons why I think this is really interesting is because I believe that King Saul was a saved person. I'm going to show you why I believe that he was saved. So he's someone that he's not some unbeliever. Because when you think about an evil spirit, I mean, just think about this. If someone's, you know, an evil spirit from the Lord, well, wow, that must be some really bad guy who's unsaved and God just, you know. But when you start to consider that, well, wait a minute, if this guy is saved and he's still receiving of an evil spirit from God, you know, well, what's to stop God from spending an evil spirit on any one of us who are saved, right? And the answer is nothing. So what I want to do is kind of look at, one, what does it mean to have an evil spirit from the Lord? Because it does not mean he's possessed with the devil. Okay, it's two different things. There's a spirit coming and troubling him and, and bothering him and, and vexing him is not the same as being possessed, literally, of, of a devil and doing things because the devil is possessing you. Uh, that's not the same thing. But... Um, First, before we get like too far here, I, I wanted to start and show you just some reasons why I believe Saul was saved. There's, there's one major reason, but we started off here in 1 Samuel chapter 10, which gives us a lot of the positive things about King Saul. So when King Saul first started, uh, he was a pretty good guy. He was a humble guy. You know, he, he didn't think very highly of himself uh, in general. And we see that he fought some battles and won and trusted in the Lord very early on, very early on, was doing good, but not very long after that, he, he started straying from the Lord. Uh, but let's look at verse number five here, where we just read in, in 1 Samuel chapter 10. The Bible says, after that, after that, thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of the prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. This is, this is Samuel speaking to Saul. Okay, he's telling him, you're going to see this. And then it says, verse 6, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. Now, I'm not saying that this is like the moment of his salvation, but what I'm saying is that here he's being used by God with the Spirit of the Lord coming upon him, even to the point of just being turned into like another man, the way that he's going to be used and prophesying through the, the, the Spirit of God in preaching like these other prophets were preaching. Even though he wasn't a preacher, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon him, and he's going to be used in this fashion. Now, as my first piece of evidence, this is still small as far as him being saved. We have seen God use unsaved people to deliver his word before, at least words that are found in the word of God. But we don't really see the language being used where the Holy Spirit is coming upon some unsaved person to like preach sermons and prophesy the way that is being done here with King Saul. I think this is a little bit different. We could use a little bit of sense to see that. But let's keep reading here. It says um, in verse 7, Let it be when these signs are come unto thee that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass, when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, what is this? that has come unto the son of Kish is Saul also among the prophets. So stark contrast to the personality and who Saul was. Anyone who knew him, you know, we're going to see here a little bit later on that, uh, well, let's just jump down to right now. Look at verse number 21. The Bible says, and this is when they're actually anointing him to be king. You know, Samuel already anointed him, but this is when he's doing this public thing. It says, when he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken, and Saul the son of Kish was taken, and when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should yet come thither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. So Saul is the type of person where he's like, you know, they're going to finally just make him officially, publicly, this king over Israel. And 
he's nervous or, you know, just doesn't want, kind of shy, right? He doesn't want to be in front of everybody. And God's like, he's hit himself among, he's there, he's just hit himself among himself. And they're going like, God, is this really the guy that you want leading us? And you're like, yeah, just, you know, just bring him out. That's the personality, that's the shyness that we see in King Saul. So then when he starts prophesying, he's preaching with these other prophets, it's like, wow, he's like, I mean, he's like another person. God has given him another heart. And this speaks a little bit to what, you know, what, I was, what I've taught before about God giving you what you need when you need it. So if God has a job for you to do, obviously God was, was um, endorsing Saul to be the king of Israel, even though he'd already explained and, and made sure the children of Israel knew that it was wicked and wrong for them to even want a king. But since they had selected a king, he st God still had these you know, rules in place, these laws in place on how they still ought to choose a king, and you know, they could still serve God and can still have a godly king, even though that wasn't what he had intended for them or wanted for them. He was still able to give them a king that can be righteous, that could be good, that could be filled with the Spirit of God, and that could lead them in a good direction. And this is what we see happening here with King Saul at the very beginning. We see that he's humble. I believe from these two things, it's already indicative that he was saved. But kind of the, the clinch pin for, sh for demonstrating this, and we show this to people out solding, but flip over to chapter 28 of 1 Samuel. We're going to spend almost the entire night in 1 Samuel. I just want to get this established first. 1 Samuel 28. And we're going to read more of this story later on, but I'm just going to jump to the verse where, you know, he goes to the witch. The witch calls up Samuel because Samuel had died at this point. And, and he's trying to inquire of the Lord. And then Samuel says this unto King Saul in verse number 19. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. So basically he's saying, you're going to lose in your battle to the Philistines tomorrow. And tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. So the fact that Samuel, and we know Samuel is speaking, again, we'll get into this a little bit more later in the sermon when we get to chapter 28 through, through the, the course of kind of going through a lot of this stuff. Samuel was saved. I don't have any doubt about that. The prophet of the Lord, Samuel, we, we could see many. I'm not going to go through and prove all of that from Scripture. Um, the fact that we're reading First and Second Samuel is, is probably a pretty good indicator that at least the guy was saved. Um, <laughs> but him saying he's going to be with, with him, like you and your sons are going to be with me, he wasn't burning in hell. So if he's not burning in hell, then obviously Saul and his sons aren't going to go and be burning in hell because they're going to be with him, right? So, I mean, it, to me, it just kind of makes a lot of sense. Now, the reason why we do this out soul winning is because every once in a while you get someone who gets hung up on, on the notion of, like, suicide, right? And they think that, well, you know, any other sin you commit is fine, but if you commit suicide, man, you're definitely going to hell, right? We're trying to show them eternal security. And we show them, well, hey, Saul is a guy that did commit suicide, because he ended up falling on his own sword. And if you want, you could just flip over to chapter 31. We'll see that in the scripture. Saul takes his own life. Yet, as we saw there in, um, in chapter 28, Samuel is still saying, you're going to be with me. So what happens is he's wounded by an arrow. And he's pretty much mortally wounded. And he doesn't want uh, the Philistines to, to do anything to him while he's still alive. And he, and he wants to die. So it says here in verse number three, and the battle went sore against Saul and the archers hit him. This is the next day, of course, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. So he asked his armor bearer, like, hey, man, just, you know, kill me now because I don't want them to do anything bad to me. It says here, but his armor bearer would not for he was sore afraid. Therefore, Saul took a sword and fell upon it. So his armor bearer is like, no, I'm not going to kill you. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to give you that, that last blow. Not going to do it. So Saul is like, fine, whatever. And then he, just, he does it himself. He falls on his own sword. Verse 5 says, and when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. Now, we also have an account of this 
in 1 Chronicles chapter 10, which is a parallel passage to this. I'll read it for you. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 4 says, Then said Saul to his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. So Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise on the sword and died. So Saul died and his three sons and all his house died together. Both of those accounts, both of those testimonies are in scripture saying that Saul fell on his own sword and he died and his armor bearer saw him die. Why, am I, why do you care about this? Why are you making a big point about this, Pastor Burson? Well, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, there's another account given that's a little bit different. And this account, though, see, in 1 Samuel chapter 31, as well as 1 Chronicles chapter 10, the story is being told by a narrator. The narrator of the Bible is the Holy Ghost. We always need to make sure we're paying attention to who is saying what when we read the Bible. Because the devil is quoted in Scripture, but what the devil says isn't true. right? We know the devil is a liar and the father of it. Or you could read the book of Job and read some of the things from Job's friends, but you can't trust that what they're saying is true, even though it's recorded as to what they said. Because at the end of Job, God says, you know, that they need to offer up sacrifices and that Job needs to pray for them because they did not speak the things that were right concerning God like his servant Job did. So God already says, pronounces at the end of Job that what his friends were saying about God were wrong. So, but we have what they said recorded in scripture, right? So you always got to be paying attention. Who's saying what are, just because they say something doesn't mean they're right. Just like Mary said to, to Joseph, you know, or to Jesus, excuse me, when he was younger, thy, fa my fa thy father and, and I have sought thee, right? Well, Joseph wasn't his father. God was. And that's why I said, you know, that I must be about my father's business, kind of rebuking her subtly, you know, as a, as a younger child, saying that he is doing the work of his father, his true father, right? So there's a lot of things that you got to be paying attention to in Scripture. But what we have in 2 Samuel chapter 1 is uh, this guy that shows up to King to David. And remember, David and Saul were at odds with each other. David was already anointed king by Samuel. David was rightfully supposed to be king. God's the one then who is be behind David after Saul fell from, fell from grace in a sense, you know, didn't lose his salvation, but wasn't supposed to be king anymore. He was, he, that that, that uh, honor was uh, taken away from him and given to David. So they're, you know, enemies against each other. So this guy shows up from the battle. L let's start reading here, verse number three. And David said unto him, from whence comest thou? This is 2 Samuel chapter one, verse number three. And David said from, unto him, from whence comest thou? And he said unto him, out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, how went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, that the people are fled from the battle and many of the people also are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said unto the young man that told him, how knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? So he wants to know, well, how do you know he's dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me, and I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I, said, and I answered him, I am an Amalekite. He said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head, and the bracelet that was on his arm, and have brought them hither unto my Lord. So this guy is claiming that Saul wasn't dead. That he happened to come upon him, and Saul's like, hey, I'm still alive, you know, basically finish me off. And he's saying, yep, so I stood on him and I made sure then that he died. I could see he wasn't going to live through it anyways. So he gives this version of the story, which is not told in either of the other accounts at all. And in fact, the other accounts say that the armor bearer saw him die. That he fell on his own sword, not his own spear, he fell on his own sword. And what does this guy do? This guy's saying this. Because he came to the, what, what really happened is he came to this body of, of Saul and took 
and, and strip things off of his dead body. He took the crown because he's, he, then he's thinking in his head, like, I'm going to bring this to David and gain the favor of David because he's going to be happy now that I'm going to tell him, I'm going to bring him the news, I'm going to bring him this crown, and he's thinking he's going to be rewarded for being the messenger. And he also added in that little bit of, yeah, and I, and I had a little part to play in the death of Saul. He wasn't expecting the response that David gives him because David actually gets really angry and he's like, you know, basically you, you, you've judged yourself. How dare you lift up your hand against the, king, the Lord's anointed? You know, he's, he, I mean, he really is just, just lays into him. But that's not what this guy thought. He has a motive. He's the one speaking. He's the one telling the story. He's not the one that killed Saul. The accounts from the narrator said that so Saul died. Like, that's how it happened. So Saul died and his three sons. He fell on his own sword when his armor bearer wouldn't do it for him. And when the armor bearer saw that he died, then he took his own life. That's what happened. And that's the, the, the witness, two witnesses in 1 Chronicles 10 as well as in 1 Samuel chapter 31. Why do I even make a big deal of that? Because suicide is not some mortal sin that's going to send a person to hell. If someone is saved, they are saved, they have eternal life. Even suicide does not damn that soul to hell. And Saul is the example of that. Saul is someone who, and this is why we go out so and we show people that, to demonstrate that. And I want to make it clear that you're not confused of going, well, wait, maybe he didn't take his own life because we've got this guy saying that he, you know, he finished him off or whatever. There's no confusion. This guy just wanted a little something extra for himself. He embellished the story to make himself look better to try to gain favor with David since he was going to be now legit like the, the next king. That's why that happened. And this was not really in my notes, but I wanted to cover that before we continue going any further. Turn, if you would, now back to 1 Samuel chapter 13. The, the story of, of King Saul is not a good story. Now, was he saved? Yes. He started off fine, but like I said, he just barely started off fine like he, he he started off fine for a short period of time because even that first commandment that we see there in first samuel chapter 10 we see samuel instructing saul what to do and he says wait there seven days and I'll be, he's giving him these instructions that he's going to fail at anyways as like one of the very first things that he screws up and does wrong is one of the very first instructions that, that he's given in chapter 10. Um, and as you can see, like between chapter 10, and chapter 13, chapter 13 starts off, Saul reigned one year. And when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him. So this is starting off basically just in the second year of his reign. And he's only reigned for a year. He hasn't had very much time to establish himself and, and everything else. But wh what I want to do is I want to look at the things that Saul did wrong because being plagued with an evil spirit from God, I also want to show you that sometimes the things that you can do that are, that are wrong or wicked that could, that could cause you potentially to be plagued by an evil spirit from the Lord may not be as severe or drastic in your own mind that you think it is. Now, they are big deals. And with King Saul, he, he sinned is a big deal in what he did. But as we're going to see as we continue through this, he never thought what he did was a big deal. And that is a big deal in itself. And, and, and hopefully, if you could take something from this sermon, is to be able to do self-analysis on your sins, on what you do, and not always try to justify yourself before God, because this can lead you into having a lot more problems. Saul had a lot of problems from the Lord that he didn't have to have that he brought on himself. And if you think about it, as we go through this too, do a comparison between King Saul and King David in your mind. If whatever you know about King David, we know, and I mentioned this this morning, you know, King David commit adultery and murder. Those are some pretty significant sins. 
That's not some little deal. That's a, that's a big deal. I mean, those are two, both of them are capital crimes. Both of them. And he commit both. He commit adultery and he commit murder. And he was responsible for this. But what happened with David, he found mercy and grace in the eyes of the Lord. When David was confronted about his sin, he repented, he grieved, he truly was, was you know, sorrowful, he truly repented, he truly you know, wanted to get right with God and had a heart to then to restore a relationship with God and accept his responsibility and, and, and not try to sugarcoat what he had done but just fessed up and said, yes, I did it. And that alone is huge. Okay, that spirit, that repentance, God wants to see that in all of us. When you do wrong, even if it's a really big deal, don't dig your heels in and harden your neck because that's when things are going to get really bad for you. Before I continue further on that, let's just go back now and take a look at some of the things that Saul did. Because what I would say, you know, for most of us, at least today, you're going to look at what Saul did and be like, that's not nearly as bad as what David did. Yet Saul was the one plagued with the evil spirit from the Lord. Look at verse number five. The Bible says, and the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. And people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash, eastward from beth -Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. So, also, remember, having a king is new for Israel, right? They're not new as a people or as a nation, but having a king is new for them. The people are confronted with a massive army way outnumbering them. And the people freak out and they get scared, right? So, it's the, I mean, they start hiding anywhere they can. They're like, we're going we're gonna to hide out. You know, there's a cave over here. We're going to hide up there. Hopefully they won't see it, you know, see me and then I can get through this or whatever. And Saul is like in charge of this group of people who are super scared. Verse 7 says, And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. So he's still got some people following him, but they're scared. They're trembling, right? And he's supposed to be this leader. Verse 8 says, And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. So he waits seven days. That's what he was supposed to do. That's what he was instructed to do, to wait for Samuel. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So obviously over the course of this week, people are getting more and more scared. They're going, man, I don't want to face this. I don't want to do this. And, and they're starting to, to leave left and right. So this is a situation that Saul's in. Verse 9 says, And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. This is what Samuel was going to do. This is what, Sam, what he was waiting for Samuel to do. So he says, well, he said he's going to be here. He's not here. So I'm just going to take matters into my own hands and do this. Now, the big problem with this is that Saul was a Benjamite. He was not a Levite. It was not his job. It was, not, it was definitely not his job from God to be offering any burnt offerings or any sacrifices. See, in the Old Testament, people can, you couldn't just have anybody doing that work. God had isolated the the and sanctify the Levites to be the people who were going to do that service for him. They were people who were holy and separated to do that work. No one else was allowed to do that. But King Saul decided, well, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures, basically. So who cares ultimately what's right? We still need to offer the sacrifice to the Lord, so I might as well just do it. Samuel's not here. Verse 10, and it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. I mean, he just barely had enough time to even do the offering, and then there's Samuel. So, I mean, how late was he really? He waited the seven days. He was still coming that day because he had just made this, this sacrifice. He's a little bit late from the time appointed, but he still makes it there. 
with plenty of time to have done the offering himself anyway, you know, for Samuel to have undone the offering, he shows up uh, and says, and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. So Saul's like, great, all right, Samuel's here, cool. But he doesn't think there's anything wrong. He doesn't even see a problem with what he had done. Verse 11, and Samuel said, what hast thou done? Samuel sees it right away. Hey, he's a big, what, are you, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore, said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. I had to force myself to do this. Right? I didn't really want to do this. I didn't really want to sin. I wanted to do everything right, but I just forced myself to do this, you know, in order to offer a burnt offering. Now, think about this, too, because... You know, I, I, as wicked as Saul was, and he was wicked, we need to see the wickedness for what it is and not get caught up in the same trap that Saul got caught in. What's he trying to do here? He's trying to offer something unto the Lord, right? It's not like he's trying to serve another God. It's not like he's trying to just ignore, well, we don't need the Lord's blessing anyways. I'll just go off and win this battle. For, you know, he wasn't doing any of that. He was trying to do everything that he knew needed to be done and offer the sacrifice. And he's just thinking, well, I mean, Samuel's not here, but we still need to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. I'll offer this sacrifice. I'll, I'll give of myself. I'll do something I know I shouldn't do, but it's all for the greater good. This is the mindset of King Saul. But the problem was it wasn't according to the word of the Lord. It was, he was breaking God's commandments in order to do that. Don't ever think... That something that you're doing, oh, but I'm going to make the sacrifice, and I'm going to give, and I'm going to do this. If you're breaking God's command to do it, God will not be pleased at all. In fact, it's going to make God angry for you to circumvent the rules that God set up to do something that, that you think he's going to want. Verse 13, and Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom un upon Israel forever. And see, I think this happened because Saul was being tested. Can he still rely and trust in the word of the Lord? No, this is right. With all the pressure coming down on you, with the time going, a little, oh man, we're running out of time here. Trust in the word of the Lord. Can you trust in the word of the Lord even when things get tense, even when times get tight? You know, it's easy to trust in the word of the Lord when there's no pressure. Yeah. Right? When, when no one, when no one is, is contradicting you, when no one's standing against you, when there's no fight, when everything's great, when everything's popular to stand with God, pff, that's easy. That's easy. I mean, think about like... like saying anything publicly, posting anything on social media, something that's right but everybody agrees with, that's easy. Yeah. You know, people will make these strong sense, you know, pedophiles should be put to death. Yeah, everyone believes that. I mean, still, I think that's changing, and it's probably going to be a time where that will be more radical to say that. But that's one of those things that people could say, oh, man, you know, or, or you know, even just a right to life and stuff like that. Those are, like, so basic Concepts They're like you're not making some major bold stand of saying like we shouldn't be killing babies in the womb That's not that it's not that radical but How about you stand when you stand for God on the things where you know It's not popular and there's definitely gonna be pushback on that that requires more faith in the Word of God knowing that it's right and and just showing that you're trusting in the Word of the Lord King Saul here, and, that's, and you know, this isn't apples, apples necessarily, but it's the same type of thing in a sense where he was supposed to be doing what's right. He's feeling this pressure to, you know, these people are leaving. He's like, man, I got to keep everything together here. So he's going to step outside of what God said to do. And what he did was foolish. He said, and, and Samuel calls him out on it and says, you know what? You have not kept the commandment of the Lord. He commanded you not to do this. He says, for now would the Lord have established that kingdom upon Israel forever. Verse 14, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. So for this, that's a big deal. This one thing that he did, he's saying, you know what? Now you've lost the kingdom. 
The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Verse 15 says, And Samuel rose and gat him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin, and Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about 600 men, and Saul and Jonathan his son, and the people that were present with them, abode in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. So now we're, gonna, we're not going to go through the rest of this. Turn if you would to chapter 15. That was his first failing. That was his first sin. And that was a big one, too. That was a big test that he failed. Because here's what, what God's looking for. God's putting someone in, a, you know, this position of being in a, a king. That's a high position. You, you have, it's, you're not just responsible for yourself. You're responsible for all the people. So if you're going to make judgments that you're going to start contradicting the word of the Lord as someone in that position, God says you are not the right person for this job at all. You need to have respect under the word of the Lord 100%. You need to know the law of God and follow it and, and, and not be willing to bend the rules with God. I mean, think about it. Politicians do this all the time. They're always looking for ways to bend the rules. You need to find someone with integrity, if they're going to be in a position of power, if they're going to be in a position of leadership, to say, we don't bend the rules. They are what they are, especially God's rules. Chapter 15, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Clear directive. Wipe them out. And we've seen this before from God against the Canaanites when he sent the children of Israel in to, to you know, inherit the promised land. This is a similar thing where he says, you know what? I'm going to bring the sins of Amalek back on their own head. This is God's judgment where he's commanding them to do this and specifically commanding King Saul to go forward and do this. He says, you need to utterly annihilate them. Wipe them out. I mean, man, woman, boy, girl, animals, all of it, just, just destroy it all. They need, they need to go. This is total destruction. Commandment from the Lord. Jump down to verse number 7. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur that is over against Egypt. So he beat them in battle. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. And utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag. And, and I want you to pay attention to that too because again, this is the narrator in verse 9. Saul and the people spared Agag. Because Saul is going to try to claim in just a little bit, well, the people. The narrator is saying, Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. So they took the commandment of the Lord that said, utterly destroy everything. He said, well, yeah, okay, we'll do that. But, I mean, look, sure, all, all the garbage, all the stuff that's vile and refuge, yeah, we'll utterly destroy that. I mean, who wants any of that? But the good stuff, I mean, come on, we can't just utterly destroy this. I got an idea. I know what we'll do. We'll utterly destroy all the people, but, the, you know, we'll save the king to do something else with him. And then, you know, we'll utterly destroy all the animals. But you know what the good animals, I mean, the, the, you know, the fatted calf, the, you know, all this good stuff. I know, we, we could just offer these up to the Lord. That's a good idea. Let's, let's sacrifice these to the Lord. Now, when people would make sacrifices to the Lord, you know what they got to do? They partook of the sacrifices. They're thinking, why should we destroy all this good meat? <laughs> we could have a barbecue, and we'll offer it unto the Lord, and we'll have a great feast, and, 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 and it'll be a good time. That's a better idea than just destroying all this stuff, Right? I mean, come on, and, and we're, you know, hey, it's, it's all offered unto the Lord. It's all sacrifice unto you, God, except God didn't tell him to do that. 
God didn't say, I want you to offer up the best of what they had to me as an offering. He said, utterly destroy it. Verse 10, then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel said, came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord. So he's going to meet him like there's nothing wrong. Again, just like last time. And he says this, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Hey, Samuel, how's it going, buddy? Hey, I did everything I was supposed to do. I kept God's commands. Now, again, too many Christians today think that, oh, I am keeping God's commandments. But you're really not. You're, you're looking at the commandments and saying, oh, yeah, I'm not going to say any, any wicked thing before my eyes. I'm not going to say evil before my eyes. But then you're turning around and doing that very thing. Oh, no, but you understand. See, it's different because, you know, when, when I do that, it's, it's, not, it's really not that bad. It's not, it's not what you think. Oh, I'm just doing this for the Lord. Whatever, whatever the excuse and, and whatever the sin, you've got to look at the commandments of the Lord and not try to make the excuses and not try to find the escape of, oh, well, it's not really a sin. Look, God's word says what it says. It's very clear. He's very clear with his commandments. There's a lot of things you're just not supposed to do. And there's a lot of things you're supposed to do. They were supposed to destroy everything. There was, there was no misunderstanding in what God said. There's no interpretation needed. Yet they didn't do it. Yet here we have Saul saying, I did, I, did, I did everything. Verse 14, and Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Then, that's funny. You did everything. How, how come I could hear these animals? I mean, I mean is that, where do where these animals come from? What, what is that? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people, no, sorry, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Oh, hold on a second there, Saul. The rest you've utterly destroyed? I thought God said to destroy everything. Yeah, yeah, he did. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, Wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Then why did you do this? God strictly commanded you to destroy. Why didn't you do it? You've done evil. You didn't obey. Verse 20, and Saul said to Samuel, yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. So now he's just really digging in and saying, no, look, I did obey. And this is a big, 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 big problem. When you're confronted with your sin, when someone's showing you, look, this is what God said, and you didn't do that, and you're like, but no, I did do that. So, yeah, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Like he's just the king of Amalekite, but I killed the Amalekites. Verse 21, but the people, so notice again, what a great leader, huh? What a great leader. Oh, but the people. Imagine me as a, as a pastor of this church. I'm supposed to be a leader, right? And, and maybe our church does something, and I'm trying to think of an example off the, off the fly here. Just do, we, we do something just completely unbiblical, right? And, and then me as leader, I'm going, well, I mean, the people all wanted to do that. I mean, I didn't really want to do that. I mean, I know what the Bible says. I know we shouldn't be doing that. But all the people wanted to do that. 
and just throw everybody else under the bus. What a horrible leader, <laughs> the leadership that is. Look, man, you did something wrong. You're the one in charge. You're the one leading. You don't blame it on the people. If the people wanted to, you know, offer the sacrifices to save the king alive, it's your job, leader, to say, uh, no, that's not what God said. I mean, if the people want to do, you know, all the people in the church, they want to do this. They want to bring in the rock music. They want to do that. But I know we shouldn't be bringing that stuff in because I know that's, you know, that's not, that's not of God. We shouldn't be doing that. But, hey, I mean, I just did it anyways because, you know, the people wanted it. Not a job. Not a job to be a politician. It's your job to, to obey God. So he blames the people again. Verse 21, but the people took of the spoil sheep and oxen, the chief of the things, which should have been utterly, now, now he's starting to admit, no, it's a little bit, it should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And, and notice how he says the Lord thy God. Not the Lord my God, not the Lord our God, the Lord thy God. Now, I'm not saying he didn't see the God as, you know, the Lord as his God. I'm not saying that at all. He's making it more personal for saying, like, hey, you're God. I mean, look, look we, we're bringing sacrifices for your God. Right? Like, to kind of entreat more, make it more personal to him. That's what I think, at least. Obviously, his phrase is used a lot, but the way that he's using it here just seems, um, you know, we're going to use this to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, that the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. So you know what God really wants? He doesn't want all your sacrifices. He doesn't want you saving all the best of all the sheep and cattle and separating them and bringing them up to God for this great sacrifice. He just wants you to obey him. And, and you know, another il illustration is as a parent, you know, what, you know what parents want from their kids? They just want them to obey. Do, do you really, as a parent, do you want your kids, like, making all these sacrifices for you as their dad or you as their mom? Like, do you really just want them investing all this time and effort and, and, and energy into just like, well, look, I made this for you at the sacrifice, at the expense of not listening to what you told them to do, right? Like, like you tell your kid, hey, I want you, you need, you need to clean your room and do your school. And then they spend all their time building some arts and craft for you. But look, daddy, you know, like, like, I love you, here you go. Okay, that's nice, but that's not what I told you to do, right? It's better, it's better just to obey when you're told to do something than it is to try to offer up some great sacrifice because God doesn't need your sacrifice. God never asked you for your sacrifice. You know, he, he commanded you to do certain things. Obey them. Now, look, there's nothing wrong with a sacrifice in itself. The problem comes in is when you sacrifice at the expense of obedience, right? right? You can obey and sacrifice. Right. You can follow God's commandments and offer and say, hey, look, I also did this for you. Just like a child can take their time and, and do something nice for their parents, that's going to be well appreciated when they've already obeyed and listened. Right. Then it's great. Then it's pleasing. It's like the free will offering for the Lord. Oh, great, that's, that's fine. You know, God... But even that, God has, you know, the free will offering, God has designated how to do it. It's like Cain and Abel. Like Cain brought the, his best out of the ground. Well, that's not what God said. That's not what God wanted. Do it the way he wants. Obeying is better than sacrifice. Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, the sin of witchcraft was another capital crime. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. So we're seeing here, look, you don't want to listen to the word of God? You don't want that to be your, your ruler? Well, then you're not going to be king. It's as simple as that. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have, so he finally admits, I have sinned. Okay, good. You ought to admit that. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So finally it comes out, he's like, you know what? I was afraid of the people instead of being afraid of God. You're making some progress here with him, but, but it's, it's very 
shallow. Verse 25, now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. So say, yeah, 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 okay, I sinned, you know, I'm sorry, but just come back with me and let's, you know. And, and Samuel's like, no, look, you don't I still don't think you understand how serious this is. I'm not returning with you. And then after going back and forth a little bit, jump down to verse 30, he says, then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people. So what does he really care about? He, he just said and admitted, I feared the people more than I feared God. That's why I did this. Yes, I sinned. Yes, I did wrong. He's saying, but you know what? Still, just let me, let me look good in front of the same people that I feared. That shows you what he cares more about even when he's called out on it. He still wants to save face instead of going, I sinned. Okay, and this just needs to be obvious and just get it out in the open. You know, I sinned and be more caring about what God thinks and getting right with God than whatever the people think. And even as a leader, even in front of everybody, you need to just be able to say, you know what? I sinned and I'm going to get right with God. And even if that means you don't save face, you own what you do. You own your mistakes. And that's what God really wants. This is why... I think, and, this, and this is a pivotal moment that he's, he's asking for this honor before the elders, everything else. Because if you go over to chapter 16 now, this is where we're going to start seeing the evil spirit from the Lord. This is, this is essentially when it starts. God gave him opportunity. Now, he still was going to remove him from being king, but he didn't have to make matters worse for himself. But this lack of true repentance, this plagues him for the rest of his life. This still thinking that he's right, thinking that he needs to keep doing what he's doing and, and, and now trying to retain his title and his office that he no longer has rightfully by God. He's still trying to cling to that by any means possible. So now when the threat becomes David, since he's the one that God chose, he's always trying to kill him. And he's always going after him and, you know, and he, and he has this obsession with not wanting to give up his control and his power that's gone to his head because he used to be humble in his own eyes and little in his own eyes, but as soon as he got that power, he got a taste of that and it lifted him up with pride and blinded him and, and then he only cared about retaining power, which is why he cared about what the people thought, not what God thought, even to this point of going, you know what, just honor me now before the elders because he wanted to keep his position and his status in front of the people for as long as he possibly could. That's what he cared about. Verse six, uh, chapter 16, look at verse number 13. I'm trying to get through this. I'm going to try to get through this a little bit quicker because there's a lot of notes when we study the, the, the life of Saul. Verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. So no longer is the spirit of the Lord uh, you know, resting or you know, being upon Saul where he's being blessed of God and, and kind of led and directed. Now God's removed that, and instead he's replaced that with an evil spirit. It's an evil spirit from God. And it's going to trouble him and vex him and, and kind of drive him mad or drive him crazy in a sense that he's, he's being vexed by this evil spirit from the Lord. Now, the solution to this problem, because he realizes and understands he has a problem with God. That, I mean, who's the source of the problem here? Saul's the source of the problem, but who he has a problem with? He has a problem with God, no one else. It's not a problem with David. It's not a problem with the people. It's a problem between Saul and God. Because Saul's not repentant, because Saul is not respecting the commandments of the Lord. And he's not making that his guide and his ruler. He wants to do things his own way. So he ends up being troubled by the Lord. Now, instead of any rational person should, at this point, 
especially if you're starting to get chased in, you get an evil spirit from the Lord, should be able to recognize and say, you know what, I better get right with God. I mean, that's where the problem is. How else do you think you're going to get around this problem than by dealing with it face on? It's the only way to properly deal with this problem and actually solve it is say, you know what, I need to get right with God. But instead, he doesn't get right with God. Instead, he tries to find another solution outside of getting right with God, outside of being, having to, to humble himself and repent and say, you know what, wow, I can't believe I've fallen so low that God is doing this to me. Instead, you know, his servants give him this great idea of finding someone to play music to make the, that evil spirit go away. I don't want to be troubled. I don't like the way I feel. I don't like this guilty conscience. I don't like feeling this way. So I'm going to try to distract myself with something else so I can just feel better. And then, and then I don't have to worry about this evil spirit. This verse 16 says, Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning and playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And so this is, this is still early on, obviously, where Saul has a, has a liking to David. He sees him, he's a great, it's a great idea. Saul had his own problems with God before David even shows up on the scene with Saul. Saul is, you know, but, but he, what he ends up doing is trying to make David be the focal point of his problems and taking things out on David instead of dealing with his problems with God. And obviously it's really bad for David then who ends up being in the life of Saul to be the object of the anger and the, the resentment and the problems that he's having with God. Now look, I bring this up for another reason is because you know, we live our lives with other people, your marriage, kids, whatever. If you allow yourself, oftentimes people do this, you get, you get into a place where you're not willing to recognize your own sin. It's clear in the Bible, you know you're wrong, but you don't want to admit it, and you don't want to get right with God. What ends up happening is that when people are in that position, oftentimes they'll take things out on someone else who really isn't the problem at all. And you start, you know, your sin starts having an impact that on other people's lives, other people have nothing to do with your real problem, and you start taking it out on them instead of dealing with it the right way. David wasn't, look, David wasn't doing anything wrong. He was just trying to do everything right. He's trying to live his life. He's trying to serve God. Trying to serve God, obey his commandments the best he can, <coughs> trying to be righteous. And then you've got Saul. At first, right, this is great. Oh, cool, great, he's here. But after a while, after time goes on, Saul still isn't dealing with his problem. It's getting worse instead of better. These little fixes of having David play this music for him, like it says here in verse 23, and it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. This only works for so long. Because after a while, what we see is then when David starts to play, he still has the evil spirit and he's throwing javelins at David, trying to kill him and trying to take out his problems on somebody else. Now, Saul just is ending up like adding iniquity unto iniquity at this point. And I you know, would encourage you, I stress you, if you ever find yourself in this position, you start lashing out at people that you love because of your own sins, you know, you're just making things a lot worse for yourself in the long run. You've got, you got to deal with your own problems and stop taking them out on other people. Yeah, it's never fun to face your own problems as far as admitting that you've done wrong, but that's the only way through, the only way to really deal with the problems. Otherwise, it doesn't go away. It didn't go away for King Saul until the day of his death. He had a problem with the Lord the entire time. And you think of, well, how many years was that? And how much misdirection of his life and focus and going after the wrong people and fighting all these fights and, and causing all this problem. If he would have just humbled himself and gotten right with God, how different could things have been for, his, for the rest of his life?
I'm going to skip some of this stuff because I've got a lot of notes here. Go to chapter 22. I want to make a point of this as well. As we follow the life of Saul, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to do that. I'm, I'm kind of spending more time in the weeds here. But when my original plan is to be a little bit more high level on a lot of this stuff because it's really interesting when you see the pattern of events. Because I've seen this pattern play out in other people before. I have. And usually you see it play out without knowing that someone necessarily is in sin at first. Like you, you, don't, you don't know because you could kind of see some of the things, but you, don't, you just don't know. And oftentimes you don't find out until a little bit later, but then I see the patterns. It's like, wow, that's amazing how this, how this works out, right? And um, we see all these things here. We study uh, 2 Kings Saul. Look at verse number 6 of 1 Samuel 22, because now we're going to start seeing Saul start to become increasingly paranoid. And this is what happens when you have the self-centered, you know, everything's about you, it's not about other people, he's worried about himself, he's, you know, he's, uh, he's taking things out on the wrong people, he's not getting right with God with himself, so now he's starting to think everyone's after him. Poor Saul, poor victim, nobody loves me. Look, just get right with God. <laughs> just get right with God, it'll solve all your problems. Verse 6, when Saul heard that David was discovered and the men that were with him, now Saul abode in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah, having a spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him, then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, Hear now, ye Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me? And there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. And there is none of you that is sorry for me or showeth unto me that my son hath stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. I talk about a conspiracy theorist here. He's thinking that everyone's against him. It's like, no. David is trying to save his own life from you and to stay away from you. And you keep going after him. But see, here's where... The, the love, the joy, the peace, the comfort, it's all gone from him. He's not walking in spirit. He's not right with God. He's got a really bad relationship with God right now. So everything, he's not standing on solid ground. He doesn't have a solid foundation. He, at any moment, he's worried about just losing everything. But when you're right with God and when you're walking right with God, you don't have to worry about a thing. You can walk boldly. You can walk confidently. You know you're doing what's right. And all these problems go away. And then you don't have to worry about being paranoid. Man, is everyone out to get me? Who, you know, they're going to find out. They're going to, you know, whatever. Like, this is what happens the further you let these things fester and get worse. The, 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 the more the cancer just builds and grows, the cancer of sin, of rebellion, of being stiff-necked, of not wanting to face your own problems, grows and gets worse and starts to impact more and more people. Jump down to verse number 13. And Saul said unto him, Why have ye conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, and that thou hast given him bread? Now this is where he's talking to the priest, or he's, he goes in and, and finds out that he was there. David's leaving. Like he's just trying to escape for his life. And of course, he, go, he goes to the temple and is like, Well, you know, can you just give me some food for my guys? And he ends up getting the sword that, that he took from Goliath, that he literally, he was Goliath's sword. If, if it's rightful for anyone, it would be rightful for David anyways to take that sword. Since he's the one that slew Goliath. But he was already, as far as anyone knew, was in good standing with the king. I mean, he was the king's servant. He is like his right-hand man. He's someone who's going out and fighting battles for the king. So Ahimelech's like, what am I supposed to do? I mean, it's David. Like, you're leader here that that's leading your army and leading your troops in the, in the victory in the battle and stuff like he asked for some bread and a sword what do you want me to do but here's the the accusation from Saul you've conspired against me as if Ahimelech's now trying to to overthrow Saul and encouraging David to do this and blessing him or whatever his wife you conspired against me thou and the son of Jesse and that thou hast given him bread and a sword and hast inquired of God for him that he should rise against me to lie in wait as at this day. So the first two parts were right. He gave him bread and a sword, but he didn't inquire of God for him to rise up against him. That didn't happen at all. Yeah. 
he just conjured that up in his own mind, thinking everyone's against me. And he's definitely, David's not lying in wait for Saul at all. Verse 14, then Ahimelech answered the king and said, and who is so faithful among all thy servants is David. He said, well, I mean, <laughs> if I'm going to help anyone out, isn't David like your most trusted faithful servant? Which is the king's son-in-law and goeth at thy bidding and is honorable in thine house? Like, he's not some crook and some criminal. He's, I mean, he's your own son-in-law. Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. So now he's addressing, you know, the false accusation. Like, I didn't inquire of God for him. Let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father, for thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. Like, like I, didn't have, I didn't know anything about this. And him like telling the truth. He doesn't know what's going on. Verse 16, And the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. And the king said unto the footmen that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. So good on the servants here that didn't listen to this wicked order to kill the priests. But you can see how far Saul has fallen. Now he's taking things out on the priests. The priests of the Lord, I mean, got like... He's not only killing Ahimelech, he's, gonna, he's willing to kill everybody there. So when his own servants, when the people who are of Israel wouldn't listen to him, it says, and the king said to Doeg, Doeg the Edomite, he's like some mercenary here, turn thou and fall upon the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned and he fell upon the priests and slew on that day four score and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. Eighty-five people, eighty-five priests died under the command of King Saul by Doeg the Edomite. That's pretty bad. Now, this is worse, I would say, than what David did. But the evil spirit that came on Saul happened way before this. This is where I'm, you know, just so you understand, when we're talking about God saying an evil spirit on someone who's saved, what he had done before, he, I mean, it was definitely wrong. He, he, dis, he completely disregarded, disobeyed the commandments of God. But because he just refused to get right, he just gets worse and worse and kind of continues this downward spiral of sin to the point to where now it's like he's killing 85 servants. He went to go see the seer back when he was looking, you know, back when he was simple, back when he was looking to just find the asses that, that had you know, escaped or whatever. He's trying to find these animals, and they went and found, oh, we need to bring a gift to the seer to help me. If you would have said, you know, in, in, so, in so many years, you're going to kill 85 priests of the Lord, he probably would have said, you're nuts. Like, there's no way I would ever do that way back earlier on. And here we see him commanding, nope, you and all your house are, are being killed. Blinded by sin, blinded by pride, blinded by a stiff neck and not getting right with the Lord. Flip over to chapter 28. Now, this is where we see Saul uh, dying, being killed, being judged, and paying for his, with his life, ultimately. Verse number three, the Bible reads, Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him, and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. I mentioned before, Without, when you're not walking in the spirit, you've got no foundation. Samuel's dead. Samuel was at least a light. He was the last judge of Israel before they, they wanted a king. Samuel was at least a light of, of truth and hope in Israel for, for following the Lord. He's gone. So now you've got King Saul not wanting to give up his power, but now he's facing another great army from the Philistines 
and he's, and he's fearful, he's afraid, it says his heart greatly trembled. If you've got no confidence in God, of course you're going to be afraid. Of course you're going to be fearful. And if you've got a problem with being fearful, just in general, I mean, just, just anyone, you have, you have problems with fear and being overwhelmed or overcome with fear, I mean, some people do. You need to, to learn to trust God, get in the word of God, believe his promises. Because you have no reason to be afraid. You have no reason to fear. If you're right with God, there is no reason to fear. Take a, take a survey of your life. Are you doing, are you, are you taking heed to the commandments of the Lord and not just justifying your sin? Because when you start making excuses for yourself, you may find yourself in this position where you, all of a sudden now you're just getting afraid of things that you should never be afraid of. Verse 6 says, And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. So Saul got himself to the point to where now he's, he's trying to ask God, you know, for help. And God said, you know what, I'm going to laugh when your fear cometh. Yeah. This is how Saul's pushed it with, with the Lord. Yeah, you're afraid now, aren't you? Oh, yeah, now you want to seek me. Funny, you didn't really want to seek me. You didn't care what I said before when you broke my commandments. You didn't care what I thought when you feared the people. Oh, now, now, you want, now you want my advice? Now you want to know what's right? No answer. I'm not going to answer you. A saved person going to God, looking for direction, no answer. Don't dig your ditch and get to this point to where you get to a point where God's not going to be helping you out anymore. Scary place to be. It really is a scary place to be. For, so, so what does Saul even do here? Does he recognize he must have a problem with God if God is just not wanting to have anything to do with him? No. He wants what he wants. So he's going to try to find another way, even if it's wrong and sinful, to get what he wants. This is how Saul operated. Saved guy. But this is what he did. It says in verse 7, Then said Saul unto the servant, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. Jump down to verse number 14. You know, she calls up um, Samuel, says in verse 14, and he said unto her, What form is he of? After she sees him, and she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed. And by the way, I was talking about the narrator of the Bible earlier. This is again the narrator saying, And Samuel said to Saul, This isn't the witch speaking. This isn't anyone else speaking. This is the narrator of the Bible saying, Samuel said to Saul. Yeah. Right. This is Samuel speaking to Saul. I'm not saying that witchcraft, you know, works in the sense of you could normally do this. But in this instance, God is, is you know, has allowed this to happen, and Samuel is speaking to Saul. Normally, and this is obviously, and I don't want to get into that really way over time. This is obviously out of the norm for, for what this witch is used to. This is totally different. She was scared. She was just like, whoa, this is, you know, not normal for what she normally does. She normally could deal with devils or whatever she does and her witchcraft. This was different. So Samuel said to Saul, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and answereth me no, no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. You say, well, I, you know, these people, the Philistines are coming to, to invade, and I don't know what to do, and God's not answering me. So I figured I'd call you, Samuel. You tell me what to do. Then, Sa then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from me and has become thine enemy? So then why, what do you think I'm going to do? If God's your enemy, if God's not answering you, what in the world do you think I'm going to do for you? 
And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Verse 18, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. So Saul ends up dying. He dies for his transgression. He dies because he didn't obey the voice of the Lord. He didn't ever get right with God. And he went and asked counsel of a witch to see. And that's why God just said, it's enough. It's enough. And he ended his life on earth. Now, I'm going to close with this because there's other examples of this. Saul's just a good example. There's a lot of things that happen in Saul's life. We get a lot of detail on these different things and how things get worse and worse and worse. And we need to use this example as something that you don't ever want to come close to being to. And we can always use, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I would never be like Saul. I would never be like that. Take heed, lest you fall. Let everyone that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest you fall. Saul's not just some reprobate, unsaved guy or whatever. He's a saved guy. Other people, same thing. The Bible says in James 4, verse 3, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss. They may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Saul was called an enemy of God, and he was a saved guy. James chapter 4 says, hey, you want to be a friend of the world? Then you're at enmity with God. You're God's enemy. It doesn't make you unsaved, but you know what? I don't want to be in a position of being an enemy of God. Ever. Ever. That's a losing fight. Things will not end well for you. The problem is sin often causes people to dig in. It did it for Saul. Asa did the same thing. He didn't want to be corrected. He ended up oppressing people when, when he was told, hey, why did you go to the king of Syria instead of relying on the Lord? And he was just like, he, in, you know, the, the, the seer, the prophet that came to him and rebuked him, he cast him into prison. Like, I don't want to hear what you got to say. And even, you know, Jonah is a similar example as far as um, not wanting to do what God commanded him to do. And then God having to chasten him, and, and, you know, and Jonah kind of had a bad attitude through a lot of it as well. Um, now, Jonah at least did what he was commanded to do. But, you know, we as believers, you know, I preach on the fear of the Lord. We need to have fear of the Lord. And catch yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> I, can't, I can't say that without laughing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Seriously, though, you need to be able to spot when you're, when you're getting into these problems. Have a humble heart and be able to repent and get right with God. Okay? Do it because don't go down the path of Saul. You may find an evil spirit from God plaguing you. And if that ever happens, get right with God. Don't try to find other worldly solutions to your problems. Oh, I've got problems with, uh, you know, being scared or depression or whatever else. And you're going to go to the psychologist, the psychiatrist, and find, like, other medication and, and this music or partying or drugs or whatever to try to get rid of your problem. That's not going to help. Yeah. When you've got a spiritual problem, when you've got a problem with God, you've got to deal with it spiritually. You've got to get right with God. You have to finally fess up and recognize and say, you know what, I haven't been right with God for however long. And if you're at the point where God's plaguing you with an evil spirit, it's been a while. Because the Lord is long-suffering and merciful. And if you're getting to this point, like King Saul was at, you got to just step up and confront your sin and say, and, and confront God and say, I'm sorry. And get right. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your word. God, I pray that you please help us all to um, have humility in our hearts, I pray that you would open up our eyes to the areas that we wouldn't have secret sins or, you know, sins that are unknown to us. Lord, we, we want to do what's right. And, um, 
Lord, help us to, to see the, the full impact of, of our own uh, sinfulness in, in our lives and in the lives of others and uh, help us to, to be able to confront them and make the changes and, and get right with you, Lord. Uh, help us through that. Please be merciful and long-suffering with us. Uh, we truly love you. We want to we do what's right. And uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.